for coming in because we've we've been pushed back a bit and there's a lot to get through. So this is about um, implementing the TCP Prague requirements for L4S. Actually, I um, can can we have it on the monitor here as well? Um, okay, I've got it on either now. Oh, where's it going? It's not on the monitor down here. It was a few seconds ago. Okay. Um, yeah, actually, I, I changed the title, but I only uploaded the slides um, with the new title. Um, I'm trying to get, get out of this TCP Prague requirements and just call it the Prague requirements because it also covers real-time media. So anyway, that's all the authors carry on next. Oh, I've got the thing here, haven't I? Where, what do we do? Green one? Yep. All right. Um, so the point of this is to um, have low delay and, in fact, very low delay and um, high throughput at the same time. Um, we've got about 10 times lower delay than the state-of-the-art AQMs um, in all the performance tests we've done um, because we're doing uh, not just an AQM, it's, it's an AQM that works with new congestion controls or with congestion controls um, that we call scalable congestion controls like data center TCP. And I'll come on to all that. That's the point of this talk. It's about I mean, implementation of TCP Prague, um, which is um, essentially DC TCP with some changes. Um, and so the idea is to use these to get very low delay over the internet, not just in data centers, um, but still have that capacity seeking behavior, both in TCP like um, transports and in real time transports, and obviously in all the others like. RPC, DNS type things as well. Right? So basically, uh, a newer way for in replacing, if you like, the best effort internet with an internet that's low delay for everything. And then you don't have to worry about delay anymore. You don't have to have it as quas. You just, you have quas as your bandwidth thing, but you never have to worry about delay anymore. <coughs> um, so there's no low delay class. It's, um, on the IETF's experimental track, the L4S architecture, and L4S stands for low latency, low loss, and scalable throughput. Um, so all, th all three of those items, I'm going to cover all them. It's also been adopted um, in January. The specs were released in DOCSIS 3.1 for cable networks, and um, cable operators are currently um, implementing that, um, should see um, products appearing, um, certainly for operators to, to try out early next year. Um, so, but this talk is about the Linux reference implementation. Next. Oh, I'm doing next, aren't I? Sorry. <coughs> right. So, when I say, I just want to emphasize this point about for every application and, and low delay. We're not just talking about SSH, voice, gaming, Although, of course, they're very important, particularly gaming and HTTP. Um, we're talking about any TCP, any quick, uh, real-time media, WebRTC, um, you know, HD co video conferencing, interactive video, cloud-rendered virtual reality. And in fact, um, that um, Oculus Rift down the bottom there, Olga, who I hope is in the room somewhere, demonstrated um, L4S at Multimedia Systems on a 40 meg broadband link with an Oculus Rift um, doing cloud rendered video from a 360 degree camera and also the, um, the uh, which one? Oh, sorry, how do you point on this thing? Which one is it? Oh, that one, yeah. Th this one here, um, with a um, HD panoramic stitched together football match and you can pan and zoom your particular view of it, which is I tried to show there with the, with the white square. But you, you can pan and zoom that and it sort of sticks to your finger even though it's rendered in the cloud um, over a broadband link. And we had four software downloads going on and a high level of synthetic web traffic and um, a gaming benchmark, all on a 40 meg link, and none of the packets were more than one millisecond queuing delay. Right. 
So um, it's, it's quite a significant change, and it means you can um, effectively forget about delay or, or queuing delay and only worry about propagation delay. Um, so, how does it work, or what, what's the big trick? Well, the big trick is scalable congestion control, and as I said, DCTCP is an example of that. So, essentially, going through one to four, um, in the early days with just tail drop buffers, your TCP sawtooth is occupying the top of the buffer. I've tried to draw here um, two things with different units in the, on the same plot. There's your bandwidth in the pipe, and then your buffer um, on top of it and your congestion window using um, the buffer. And then as, as you bring in AQM in number two, you can push down the top of the spikes conceptually um, so you get, still get full util utilization, but you don't um, use so much of the buffer. But if you try and push that down further in number three, you start underutilizing the link. And the problem is that unscalable TCP, which I call classic sender congestion control, like Reno, like Cubic, in fact, as well, um, and I'll, I've got a um, slide on that, um, has these saw teeth are getting bigger as you go faster over the years. And so you can't have both low delay and high utilization unless you go for number four, which is the smaller saw teeth, which is what you get with data center TCP and the like. Um, so you can have both low delay and high utilization. Um, and then, of course, you, you can bring down your buffer sizing and all the rest of it. <coughs> um, so just, just to give you an example of this, Cubic, um, shown here, running first at um, one rate, and, and it does, it, this is a sketch, not, not, not an actual plot, uh, running at one rate, and then running eight times higher, cubic in red and data center TCP in blue, and the saw teeth of cubic, sorry, the saw teeth of cubic are um, getting longer as you get faster. So at, at, the, at the 100 meg rate, they're 250 round tri trip times long. When you go eight times faster, they get twice as long, and that keeps on going. And that was the problem with Reno originally, um, which was why Cubic was introduced, that Cubic is still um, just not quite as unscalable as Reno was. Reno was, was growing linearly with, with rate. Cubic's saw teeth are, are growing bigger and bigger as you get faster, but not as fast as Reno was growing. And data center TCP, they don't grow at all, they're invariant they stay the same size, whatever your rate, and that's what makes it scalable. And that means, and so the little sort of um, uh, magnified area there shows the, the data center TCP saw teeth, the reason you're not getting a, a larger variation delay as things get faster is they never change on average as you get faster over the years, right? And so they, um, th this little parameter V, that tells you how many you get in a, um, in a round trip time. And with data center TCP on average, you get two um, for any rate. With cubic, it goes up, as you see, from one 250th to one 500th. In other words, one every 250 round trip times or one every 500 round trip times. So effectively, you're running blind between each of those control signals, um, whereas in data center TCP, you're getting a signal every, t every round trip time. It's a much richer signal. So that's, that's sort of the intuition that gives you um, why it all works. <coughs> but it might be scalable, but it's too aggressive for the internet. If you try and put DCTCP um, on the internet, it needs explicit congestion notification, and each tip of those saw teeth raises the ECN level. E each one of those is another ECN mark, or at least one. And so... Um, if you put that alongside classic congestion controls like TCP or QUIC, they detect a very high congestion level compared to what they think of, you know, every 250 round trip times or something getting one ECN mark. And so they back down to a very low rate. And that's why um, data center TCP was called data center TCP because it meant keep me locked up in a data center. Right? Um, 
it, it wasn't because it only works in a data center, it was because you'd need to change the whole internet all at the same time to deploy it on the internet because it doesn't coexist with existing traffic, at least not until now, and that's what, what um, the point of what we're doing is. <coughs> so um, I'm only going to briefly talk about the um, coupled AQM because I want to focus this on the TCP side of it um, because there's a later talk in track three, I think, um, by Olga on her implementation of the dual queue coupled AQM. Um, but very briefly, it relies on using um, the remaining code point in the ECN field of the IP header, ECT1, um, to identify this traffic as L4S ECN. Um, and senders set that, which classifies it into a second queue called the L4S queue or the low latency queue, if you like. And all, um, all the existing classic congestion control type traffic that doesn't use that gets classified into the um, other queue. This is not um, bandwidth priority, it's just sort of old and new. It's just an incremental deployment technique to, to have one queue for the, for the new stuff and the other for the old stuff. And the idea is that the old stuff doesn't get any worse than it does today. You can, yeah, this is a framework, you can have different AQMs in those two queues um, with um, a Pi AQM in the lower queue, you get the same um, delay characteristics as you do today with Pi. And the idea is that in the um, L4S queue, you can get this 10 times better delay. And of course, 10 times better delay means, uh, queuing delay means um, you, you effectively don't need so much server infrastructure. You can have larger radiuses served by one server because you've got more flexibility with your um, with your propagation delay. But anyway, back, back to this. <coughs> um, so ECN code point gets you into the other queue, and then you have a conditional priority scheduler, um, which gives priority to the L4S queue, but only priority in terms of delay, not in terms of bandwidth, because there's this coupling going back the other way, which is on the next slide, but I'll, I'll just briefly explain it on this one. And what that coupling does, it, it works against the priority scheduler. What it does, it puts the um, level of congestion marking from the um, classic queue into the, the L4S queue. It couples it across, so it looks as if the traffic is in the other queue. So, so it sort of adds enough congestion in there to represent the traffic that, that is in the other queue. And that means that the um, scalable senders leave space if there is traffic in the orange classic queue. The, the um, low latency um, flows think there's traffic there, they leave space for it, and that means that even though they've got priority for the latency, um, the coupling means that they don't get priority for the bandwidth. And, and um, so overall, you get um, flow rate fairness, if you like, you know, the, the, the flow rates of each of the flows are the same as though it's one pool of bandwidth, even though it's two queues. <coughs> now, um, just to explain that in a bit more depth, the bandwidth pooling, you've got, um, it, it's slightly more interesting than that, in that the, um, I've got, you know, you've got maths here, right, <laughs> and this is, um, you know, we, we need to explain why this squaring is important, and that's because all the classic congestion controls, <coughs> their, their packet rate runs to this formula that most TCP people um, know, or at least TCP researchers know, which depends on the square root of the drop probability. <coughs> and so when we couple across, we have to square um, the the probability that we're coupling across to the other queue to counterbalance that square root so that um, it represents those flows in the other queue. And, and I didn't think that was going to work that well um, when we thought up the idea, but it actually works really well. You get very um, similar flow rates as if you were all in the same queue. Um, so just, just an example on the right there, you've got two numbers. 
So if you've got 0.09% um, packet drop level in the classic queue, <coughs> um, that is the square of 3%, because obviously the numbers are smaller than one, so when you square it, they get even smaller. Um, and so you're getting that 3% marking, which is what I said about this more frequent marking um, in that earlier slide with the small sortie, right? <coughs> and that's what um, the scalable senders will induce. And you see there, they haven't got the square root on the, um, sorry, on the, sorry, I need to go back. Here, the scalable senders don't have that square root, and that's what makes them scalable. Um, that, that's why they're linear. Um, right. So, the most important requirement then is to ensure that these um, scalable congestion controls deal with an internet that doesn't always have that system in every queue. The idea is you put that dual queue system where the bottleneck is, which is why um, cable labs have adopted this for DOCSIS. Um, and similarly, it's being worked on um, for DSL and for access into uh, the access on, on um, data centers. <coughs> um, and we need to make sure this aggressive traffic doesn't um, harm other traffic. So in order for scalable congestion controls to use the internet, when we first demonstrated this at the ITF in this city, Prague, in July 2015, the day after um, there was an ad hoc meeting of about 30 people working on DCTCP to try and pull together a set of mandatory uh, requirements that would be needed to change DCTCP to make it suitable for the public internet and some optional performance requirements as well. <coughs> and, and we called them at the time, or Matt Mathis suggested the name TCP Prague, and so we called them the TCP Prague requirements, but I'm trying to get away from that and just call them the Prague LFRS requirements because um, they're not just for TCP. They apply to any transport, quick, real time, whatever. <coughs> um, and they, they have evolved into IETF conditions for setting this ECT1 code point in IP. And in the last draft, I've taken out the word TCP Prague requirements. Right. <coughs> um, so, um, what is TCP Prague? I'm, I'm going to quickly try and skip through all this. Um, it's a new Linux congestion control model and, and module, and I can say that because finally we got it um, an RFC out yesterday. Phew. Um, <coughs> um, and essentially, it's DCTCP with mandatory use of certain improvements to the base TCP. So things that are already there, it's sort of a, like a set of mandatory configurations of other bits. It's a configuration of mandatory other bits. Uh, but there are some other um, new parts as well. Um, and so most of it is bits that were useful for other reasons that have been pulled together into one um, implementation. It's usable for testing, but it's still work in progress, obviously. Um, it's available from that repo. And as I say, RFC submitted yesterday. And they're the instructions for loading and enabling, and they're also in the paper, so I won't read them out. So these were the, the Prague requirements. <coughs> um, seven of them. I'm not going to read them through, because I'm going to quickly go through them all. First is, um, in order to set this ECT1 code point, the sender must have this scalable behavior. And it obviously applies for V6 as well as V4. We've got the same ECN field. And um, <coughs> we put an RFC in to, to change, so, so you could also do this with DC TCP. Um, but um, actually, I'm not sure we have put the RFC in for DC TCP yet. Um, but we intend to. Um, but for TCP Prague, it's default ECT1. All right. Um, and, but you can ch change it if you want to, if you're doing testing on a network where you, you want to, um, you know, for some reason, you, you need to label things differently on a test bit or something. Um, the um, next requirement is that you need 
accurate feedback of ECN in TCP because originally TCP um, only gave you at most one um, signal per round trip time in its feedback, even if you had multiple and you need this fine-grained. Mia um, gave a talk on that at NetDev 2.2, uh, this thing called Accurate ECN. I don't know if any of you were there. Um, but essentially, it's, it's a, you can think of it a bit like um, the original TCP only gave you one drop signal per round trip time, and then SAC was added to get, to get the actual drops in a round trip time. You can think of it like that. Um, and this has been going through the IETF for many years. In fact, I started on that in, I looked it up the other day, I think it was 2003. <laughs> um, and that's hopefully coming up for working group last call, but we have been saying that for quite a while. Um, it, it, um, so it gives you every ECN mark um, back at the sender. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to have to skip over some of this. One, one, one important thing there down the bottom, um, that obviously depends on having accurate ECN on both ends. If you want to do this for testing, we've added a, um, a non-default syscontrol option um, to force the other end to give you feedback, even though it's, it, it hasn't got accurate ECN on it. And, and we, can, we can do that using um, sort of faking the acknowledgement of the other end's um, ECN all the time. So um, it f as soon as it sends us a signal, which it would, it would repeat the whole round trip time, we, we turn it off straight away um, by sending the acknowledgement all the time. So it's unreliable, but um, at least it allows you to test it and, you know, use it. Um, so that, um, I think I'll leave accurate ECN there. Um, right, the important one, falling back to Reno-friendly control um, uh, behavior on the sender. And so if you detect a loss, that means you're probably not in an L4S queue. You're probably running over, your bottleneck is somewhere else. Obviously, it may be a radio loss or whatever, but that's the general problem you have with the internet. So we've patched um, DC TCP, and we did submit this one, RFC this one anyway, and um, uh, Larry, for good reason, says he doesn't want to do it quite like that in DC TCP, but we're doing it like this in TCP Prague because it's for the public internet. Um, but this, this patch was actually submitted as well two years ago for DC TCP, uh, but got lost um, because DC TCP actually doesn't respond to um, a loss if it's if it's a fast retransmit loss, that, and, and that is a bug that has to be sorted out somehow. Um, and um, we've sorted it out in TCP Prague, and Larry wants to look further at it for DC TCP. Um, so um, DC TCP only responds at the moment to a timeout loss, um, and uh, so, there's a, so there's a bit of work there. But rightly, Larry didn't didn't want to. Um, do what we're doing on the internet because if you're in control of every queue in your, in your data center, your ECN marking will precede a loss and so you don't want to do a full um, uh, loss reduction as well as doing all the ECN marking reduction. Whereas on the public internet, um, you can't control that all your um, bottlenecks are ECN capable. So um, it's correct to do a proper halving um, when you get a loss. Unless you're BBR, of course, and then you do what you want. But um, <coughs> um, so um, the other one is what if you detect classic ECN at the bottleneck? Well, it's actually quite hard to detect classic ECN. Um, Effectively, what you're having to detect is a, an increase in delay before you get, uh, or while you're getting um, ECN marking, because if you don't get that I increase in delay, you're probably at a um, shallow threshold queue, like the L4S queue that I talked about. Whereas if you do, um, you're at a classic queue. Um, 
the, at the moment, we haven't put that in because, as far as we know, all the e classic ECN on the internet is FQCODL, and so you've already got that isolation from other flows, so you don't need to worry about being aggressive because you're, you're an FQ system, which is making sure that you don't use other flows' bandwidth. Um, but, um, I mean, we've done millions of uh, measurements to try and find other CE um, generating, uh, CE meaning congestion exposure, uh, sorry, congestion experienced um, on the internet. And so far, not found any, but if we do, obviously we'll put that in, but we don't want to add complexity if it's not actually there. <coughs> so it's a potentially a non-requirement, but we're willing to put that work in if, if someone can find um, some ECN, ECN routers on the internet. I was talking to Tallis last night, he thought there were some, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, so, the, so the next requirement... Um, how are we doing for time? I think I'm going to skip over this one. Um, and... Uh, this is the PDF, isn't it? So these were all hidden slides that I would jump to if um, people ask questions, because um, I haven't got time for all these. The, <coughs> the final one, um, I think, is detecting loss um, in units of time. And so we're taking the opportunity to um, require, mandatorily require rack or um, something like it. Um, and that means that the network can um, reduce its intolerance to reordering, so it doesn't have to resequence, and you can do that at the end system. There's been a long discussion of this on the lists, um, uh, and that's, a, that's a, a great advantage. By having this separate queue, it allows you to know that everything is using rack rather than just some things are using rack and all the old stuff isn't, so you can you know that everything's being less tolerant, uh, less intolerant to reordering, or more tolerant to reordering, so that you can, um, uh, you don't have to keep everything in such strict order in the network, which means you can make your switches go faster, you can make your links go faster and everything, because you haven't got that, um, you know, you can, you can parallelize everything more, and, and even if you get things a bit out of order, as long as you're, you're, you're within this, this time period that RAC allows you're all right. Um, all right. Now, these are the performance optimizations. One is to put ECN on control packets, um, which TCP doesn't allow. Um, I want to try and allow time for questions, so um, I'll just skip that one. Oh, yeah, that's, this is probably the most important aspect of it. Um, in order, uh, when you, let's, let's go back one, yeah, I need to explain this. TCP, when, it, when ECN was added, it, it was said you must not put ECN capability on the SYN, on control packets, on PureAx, on, um, on um, SYNAC, on FINS or ESETs, all the rest of it. Um, and we went through all that and knock down all the arguments. It's going through the IETF now, and, it, it, uh, and now we've got this accurate ECN feedback, which gives you the feedback on all these packets, so you can, or you should be able to turn it on on everything if you've negotiated accurate ECN feedback, uh, which is the thing I mentioned Mia did. And um, Olivier posted that as part of the... Um, TCP Prague thing yesterday. So there's now a, a version of Accurate ECN that's up to the tip of the main line. Um, and there is a problem, though, with this, uh, that there was uh, uh, some code back in May 2012 put into um, the ECN part of TCP that was trying to detect network mangling. And because... The old behavior said you don't put um, ECN capability on the SYN. That was used as a test to see if there might be network mangling. And, it, and if there was ECT on the SYN, it turned off ECN. So now we want to put ECT on the SYN. We've got this problem that you, 
you, you hit your ECN server and it turns it off. Right? So um, Olivier has also submitted a, um, a very simple patch for, um, for NetStable for that so that it will go out to all the existing installed base of ECN servers so that it tests not just for uh, in the TCP flags, it doesn't just test for um, the two that say I want ECN, it also tests that the others are zero because when you're using accurate ECN, one of them will be one and when you're using anything in the future, you'll probably have changed one of them. So it just it, it makes that test more specific and hopefully that um, will get backported fairly quickly and get out um, because it's so simple and we'll start to be able to use the existing install base of, um, of ECN servers with ECN on the SIN. <coughs> right, um, and there's a, the next talk is about this, so I won't cover this at all. I, ju I just was doing this. Um, Joachim's not very well, but I think he's still okay to do the talk, and then I think he needs to go home. Um, it's about how you get a faster flow start, how you get faster than additive increase. And so the summary is that these were all the requirements. And um, for those of you that are colorblind, I've put in bold the ones that are on green compared to orange so that you can tell the difference because I had that feedback from someone who couldn't tell the green from the red. <coughs> um, and as you can see, about half the requirements are in the base TCP stack. And we've done most of them and nearly done um, the other one, the, the in-progress one. I've, I've got a, well, he's, the code is available, but um, we're still working on it. Um, and we didn't feel it was ready to put in yet. Um, some of them can potentially go into DC TCP, but our main focus is TCP Prague. And there's two there you see um, are in orange or red. Um, the Reno friendly of classic ECM bottleneck is the one I said we'll put in if necessary. And the reduce RTT dependence was the one I skipped over because we've only simulated it. Um, so I think, oh yeah, I suppose I, I, I ought to show you a performance plot. Um, so that's uh, the, oh, what did I just do? Yeah, sorry, pressing the wrong button again. Um, so that's um, TCP Prague, or actually this is DC TCP. Um, which is the same congestion controller. I need to start off by explaining the plot. What we've done here is um, done it log scale. It's a CDS, a, a, that's a cumulative distribution function to show you the delay. And that, this says 99% of the packets ha uh, have better than that delay, 99.99 have better than that, and so on, down to five nines. And um, these are all the other congestion controls. In the interesting one is the red one, which is the classic queue that's working alongside the blue one in that dual queue system. And the, the aim of this plot is to show that it's no worse than Pi was. I mean, it's, it's a bit worse there and a bit better there. It all depends where you look. But it's not significantly worse in any particular place. Um, so, you know, this sort of do no harm. But for all the traffic as it moves over to the new scalable control, you get about 10 times better um, delay at every percentile. It's a, you know, 10 times better than SQTOL is this great one down here. Um, and it splits uh, into the ECN and non-ECN here. But I, I think what you're finding here is the, um, the, the, the size of the sample is small, so small that it becomes irregular here because there aren't many packets at that one in 10,000. Um, so um, there, th oh, and this is a this is a real hammering load. So we're getting two milliseconds at the 99th percentile here. At the, at the median, at the 50th percentile, it's about 100 to 200 microseconds on the public internet. This is, you know, this uh, we're, we're talking now microseconds of queuing delay on the public internet, not not even milliseconds. Um, uh, I mean, SQCoddle came pretty close, you know, two milliseconds, median delay, two, uh, something like that. Um, but 
it's the percentiles that are important when you um, need to do real-time media because the buffering sort of expands to, 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 the, to the level of delay and that's what gives you, you know, if you're going to do interactive real-time media um, and you know, control using video and all the rest of it, you need to get the, the higher percentiles down. Um, so I think, yeah, and, and that there's the, um, the spec of the traffic here. I, I can go through loads, loads more um, traffic scenarios. We've got millions of them, and I mean millions. Um, and and I'm, I'm aware that um, Dave is, is unable or feels unable to test this himself, and that's, that's a shame because this, this does need to be tested. Um, you know, by other people, and all this needs to be validated by other people. But I'm hoping um, it will prove to be as as good as. Well, I mean, essentially, it's very difficult to get queuing delay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's um, and and I'm hoping you'll find that. So um, the summary is: you've got frequent these frequent markings are what gives you the leap in performance. You get your low latency, your low loss, and your scalable throughput. Um, and importantly, it's a set of incremental changes to the network and to hosts that we're not doing anything particularly radical here. Um, and we do now have a patch out for RFC, finally, All right, for TCP Prague and the other one. <laughs> okay. Right. Dave. is going so I just have two quick questions of the audience and then a statement how many of here really understand what ECN is the markings in the header the classic ECN behavior defined by the RFC can I get a hand, raising of hands that people understand how ECN is supposed to work so for everybody else in this room even the concept of ECN is foreign and that means that the debate that was been raging on the buffer bloat.net bloat mailing list is incomprehensible to most people. And I would really encourage people to read the L4S and the GCP Prague and the other requirements while getting a deep understanding of how ECN works. Second question is, how many people here have heard of bufferbloat.net? Hey, well, it's more people than have heard of ECN. So uh, we've been a group working uh, with academic researchers all over the world. It's all volunteers. There have been some great contributors of things like Eric Dumazes, for example, uh, TCP, did, he did FQ Coddle, that's our highlight thing, which is now deployed at 100% or so. So if you look at that debate and you look at this wonderful slide where, you have to also get that there's three requirements to L4S that are really problematic, one of which is it repurposes the last bit in the IP header for one specific congestion control, DCTCP, not BBR, not Cubic, not Prog, requires a patented, under FRAN terms, AQM, which is, and up until now, all the benchmarks and all the source code have been proprietary, impossible for my group to reproduce. I have been welcoming the fact that code is finally landing, and I am looking forward to being able to do a full evaluation of it in the uh, coming weeks. Okay. One more uh, thing, I, I Bob, one more just, thing, I, Bob, one more I thing. I must just jump in there and say the code was released under GPL v2 in July 2016, but you have never used it. I am because of the Fran because patent. You don't want to. No, yeah. because of the Fran patent and the fact that we are competitors, I can't touch the patent. I'm hoping someone else in this room is willing to go touch patented code in order to be able to give me a black box so my team can evaluate it. Um, so anyway, one last thing: uh, Bufferbloat.net formed their own working group. It's called ECN Sane due to many things. And that's a link. All of our documents are linked to off the bufferbloat.net website, along with our charter, a means of operation, and the source code we're landing to a competing proposal called Some Congestion Experienced, which we hope to discuss at the next IATF. And code is available for that as well. Thank you, Bob. Is it? Where, where's the code for SCE? Right. Okay. One of the issues. 
So one of the issue of the RFC 3168 uh, ACN was that it could be abused by people pretending yep. to use ECN while they were not really reacting to the signal. What prevents anybody to use ECT1 as, oh, I'm good. Okay. I'm a good citizen. So, so um, in, the, in the DOCSIS version, and, and this isn't in the um, Linux version yet, um, we've put a queue protection function in front of the L4SQ so that anyone causing high delay, any flow causing high delay gets kicked into the other queue. And, and that can catch packets uh, after one or two packets of, of, of a flow. Right? Um, but the, I mean, the ECN that's currently in FQ Coddle, um, obviously you've got the, the flow protection in there. But um, the, the other thing that you, you, you've got protection on in the um, dual queue is that when, when you saw the, the priority scheduler there, it said that um, the, it's a conditional priority scheduler, so it, it, it allows the lower queue to have some priority, whatever, whatever the other queue is. And there, there's two different schedulers for doing that in the, in the code um, as, as two examples. Um, that's weighted round robin with a, with a high weight for the other one and I think called a time-shifted FIFO. Now, um, the, so the other aspect of that is that um, any ECN flow, um, you know, that, that problem, we, we did a lot of experiments with, with overload, you know, like DOS attacks using ECN and things like that to show that you couldn't actually get worse performance than if you um, were using non-ECN because the um, queue turns off ECN when it gets, um, when it gets overloaded. And, and so you you can't get it to both overload and um, and without it turning off ECN. So it's, it's st it's, it, it starts ignoring ECN if you start using it as an attack. And, and we, we did um, experiments that show that just a very small window when you can get slightly better um, attack force than not using ECN um, before the, the, the machine has to turn it off. How do you avoid to cannibalize um, individuals inside the high priority queue? Because, I mean, there you have no kind of... Uh, I, I didn't get the, the verb. How do you... How do you uh, avoid uh, cannibalizing one oh, cannibalized. Right. Uh, resident of, uh, versus the other? Because it, can, it may happen that you have um, two individuals with different RTT inside the, uh, inside the class, the high priority class. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I assume that one might, I mean, you're, you're not having fairness inside the class. You have fairness between the two classes. Yeah, but that, um, I mean, inside the class, it's just the same as multiple TCP flows or real-time flows like you have in a FIFO at the moment. I mean, that, that's how the internet works at the moment. Yeah. No? Okay, so you have no... Um, I mean, con congestion has um, some kind, some somehow signaling only for. I mean, if s if there's a individual inside the high priority class mm -hmm. that uh, has a smaller RTT, it can take advantage of the others which are in the in the same class. Like the yeah, yeah, the like like the internet does today. If you've got a smaller RTT, TCP goes faster. Okay. But the the um, Round trip time independence. We ha we have done simulations, but this isn't in the code yet, of a of a um, TCP prog that is less dependent on round trip time. But but otherwise, what you're saying is the same as today. It is it, it is different, and I, I I could go through that side, but I notice we're we're way late. Um, and the um, the difference is that um, without a queue, you're you've got much less of a cushion. So le let me try and explain. Um, um, I with, with, pardon? I'll, 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 I'll try and explain. It, it, 
if, if you've got no queue and you've got like a two millisecond and a 200 millisecond round trip time competing against each other, that one will go 100 times, sorry, this one will go 100 times faster because it's 200 over two, yeah? Um, but if you've got a queue of, say, 100 milliseconds, you've, you've then got 102 against 300, and so there's only one to three difference, right? And, and, and so when you haven't got a queue, yes, you've got more of a problem, and that's why we, we're, we've been working on a, a, a non rtte dependent congestion control. But otherwise, it's pretty much like the current internet is a problem. Uh, you you want to cut? Sorry? Yeah, we're 15 minutes over. Yeah. Um, is Joachim still well enough to give his talk? Yeah. While he's coming up, I just wanted to respond to Dave and, and say that, you know, we've been working on this and working through the, all the ITF process to get this code point now since um, 2015. And, um, you know, you, you have to engage in that process, no matter how painful it is. Pardon? Yeah. And we since, uh, well, not, not on this subject, on SCE, you've been shipping running code since two days ago. <laughs> yeah, right. I, we've all been shipping code, you know, since some year about something, but not SCE. So, you know, yeah, yeah.